ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for, for coming tonight. My name is Lindsay Hilson from Channel 4 News. And I'm particularly glad to be here because I have this nagging guilt the whole time, which is that we think about the Arab Spring, we think about Libya, we think about Egypt, we think about Bahrain, and we've forgotten about Iran. And we shouldn't forget about Iran because Iran is tremendously important and there's a lot of people in Iran right now having a pretty terrible time. And amongst them are these filmmakers who were arrested. Now, what we're going to do is we have a panel here who are going to, to talk about this and we have a, a short film. Let me first of all, with my, and you, I hope you'll excuse my bad pronunciation, but I'm just going to read out the names of these people and we're just going to have a little think about where they are tonight because they've been arrested and I presume are they in Avin? They're in Avin prison. Can we, somebody please sort that um, telephone out? Thank you, Mark. Okay. Yeah. Okay, the names of the filmmakers are <coughs> Nassar Safarian, Moshtaba Mirta Mazb, Hadi Afaride, Mohsen Shar Nazdar, Kayatun Shahabi, and Merdad Zahedian. They are Iranian filmmakers who were there trying to tell stories about their own country and they are now in Yvine prison tonight and that's why we're here today. This short six minute film, which is called rather wonderfully, this is not a film, um, which was premiered in Cannes and is about to be shown at the London Film Festival, was made by Jeff Arpanahi, who you may be aware of, who's a very um, uh, famous filmmaker who also, Mazia will tell us about the problems that he's been having, and uh, Moshtaba Mirza who's one of the filmmakers who's been arrested. So let's start, Roxana, let's start by watching the film. It's time. an excerpt from it. It's an excerpt, a six-minute excerpt from the film. <coughs> الو سلام خان غیرت سلام خان راحت باشید پناهی هستم قربان شما مرسی شما خوبی جانم قربان خانم غیرت خبری نشد نه خیر نه خیر بچه‌ها هنوز تصمیم نگرفته یعنی الان شرایط چیه تکلیف چیه یعنی تا عید مشخص میشه یا نمیشه فکر نمی والا بستگی داره ببینید یه وقت می‌بینیم که یه فشاری روشون وارد میشه خوری رفته میگیره ولی احکامی که من اخیرا دیدم هیچ کدوم رو زود صادر نکردم ببینید شما فکر میکنید که این قاضی جدید رأی رو دوباره تایید میکنه یا نمیکنه چون خیلی از من میپرسن من تصورم این است که اون مجازات تکمیمیش رو یعنی چی تدمیم؟ یعنی اون تکمیمی اون سی سالی که گفته بودن آه بیس سال اون بیس سال اون بیس سال رو فکر میکنم که منتفی بدونه بله و خود زندان رو هم شاید یه مقداریش کم کنه حد من حد یعنی شاید کم کنه یعنی بالاخره زندان رو حتما میره بالاخره زندان داره بالاخره نمیاد کاملا حکم براحت بده مگر اینکه یک فشار قوی یک دستور قوی یک تصمیم قوی یه یه اینجوری باشه چون من سابقه نداشتی که ببینم بیاد و براحت یعنی چی این فشار همون فشار مثلا مثل باستابا و این جریان هم طور چیزایی که بوده و خواست غیر از خواست جامعه جهانی خواست داخلی خود خواست داخلی خیلی مهم رخشان هم با من صحبت کرد بله و بهش گفتم و اینا دیگه نمیدونم حالا چه اقدامی چه توصیهی چه عبد جوی جلب نظر بیدونید آخه تو داخل سینماگرا خب به دلیل شرایطی که دارن همه چیز دولتی هستش واقعا نمیتونن کاری کنن یعنی اگر کوچکترین کاری کنن جلوی کار اونا هم گرفته میشه واقعا توقعی هم من ندارم که عکس العملی از طرفش کاملا میفهمم کاملا میفهمم من اخیرا یک حکم رو که چهار ماه بود که سرکوب شده بود زندان دو سالش رو تبدیل کرد به یک سال بله فهمیدم ولی بله بعد... بود که کرد ولی نیاز حکم براعت بده نداشت تا حالا من موردی نداشت یا تایید کرده یا یک ذره کم کرده یعنی این پس من س... پس من میرسم بی سال رو بعدن از بین میبره و شاید روی مجازات شیش سال هم یک 
دیگه پس من ساکمو پس من ساکمو آماده کنم بزنم جمع دم در دیگه اینطور که شما میگین چرا دخترم؟ آقای کیجان گردی؟ خب. باز کن. صدای بوغ پایان مکالمه می آید مریم لحظه ای فکر می کند با آنکه ناراحت است قرار بود که آدم تعریف کنه که فیلم نمی ساخت. ببین مواظب باش مواظب باش دیگه باش ببین تو ب... تو نمیخواد کاری کنی تو خودت مواظب خودت باش در سر ایجاد نکن ببین در س... ببین در سر ایجاد نکن برو باش خود حافظ کار میکنی؟ هیچ دارم از بیکاری فیلم میگیرم اون که نمی... اونو که نمیشه ساخت دقل بینم با موبایل میسونم بکار کنم میگه از سرمونی ها که بیکار میشن سر هم دیگر میتراشن هم میگه من میگه که بتونیم بریم بشینیم دوباره اینو ببینیم علاکه یه چند تا من دیگه بزنیم بیم چی میشه نه درست بگم از درام همون Okay, thank, thank you very much. Our panel tonight is Saeed Kamari Dekan, who will be familiar to anybody who reads The Guardian as uh, their Iran correspondent now, however, living in exile here. Uh, Borzul Sharafidi, who is from BBC Persian, and that's a very important part of understanding this story because the reason that these people have been arrested is allegedly because of their alleged connection with BBC Persian. And um, Mazi Bahari, an Iranian filmmaker who was himself held in Evin prison for, I don't know how long he was, Mazi but it was a long time. Days. 118 days in 2009. So we're going to start off with, Mazi will start by giving us, telling us what he can about <coughs> what has happened to these people and why, and also I think a little bit about that 
film. So let's start with you, Mazia. Well, I can tell you what's happening to the people, but not why, because if we could say why the Iranian government does what the Iranian government does, we would be in a much better situation. That's very true. <laughs> there is no logic, really. Uh, I mean, I have to put that film in context that uh, for people who got maybe overexcited about the riots in Iran, that was not the riots. That was the last Wednesday of every year that Iranians celebrate. It's a traditional Iranian ceremony that they have bonfires and it's a Zoroastrian tradition. And that scene was filmed during that night, the night of the last Wednesday. And I'm really glad that we showed that excerpt because it showed three things in the film, maybe four things. The fourth being that Tehran's traffic is horrible, but that's besides the point. The first thing is that the judges do not uh, make decisions independently. So there is internal pressure and there is external pressure. And the judges are affected by whatever pressure they're receiving from uh, the outside and the inside. The other thing is that the people inside the country, the filmmakers, the House of Cinema, which is an institution that represents a combination of guilds, trade guilds, cinematographers guilds, the stage designers guilds, etc. Uh, they want to do something for the filmmakers, but they are intimidated and they cannot do anything. And the third thing is that the government is susceptible to the outside pressure. And that uh, Jafar Panahi, who you saw in the film, and Moshtab Amir Tahmas, who was behind the camera and he just appeared in the last uh, couple of scenes, they somehow implied in the film. I haven't seen the, f the, uh, the film in full yet, but uh, I think that it's implied in the film that the government is susceptible to outside pressure. And I'm really glad that uh, you are here because these gatherings remind the Iranian government that these uh, friends are not forgotten. So what's happened uh, with these five filmmakers, and uh, there's another filmmaker who's in jail. Actually, one filmmaker whose name is mentioned in this article is not in jail, uh, because in the beginning they just published the initials of filmmakers, so there was a lot of uh, guessing going mm. on, and that filmmaker is not arrested, fortunately. Okay. And there's another name mentioned that uh, no one knew, so we know that for sure five filmmakers are in prison, and five names are mentioned. Uh, what happened was that since uh, the beginning of maybe 2008, when the BBC started to think about uh, starting a Persian television channel, the Iranian government somehow wanted to prevent that decision by the BBC. So they started to intimidate people, and I was involved somehow in the beginning as well, and with other people. I was uh, doing a film here, so I, had, I received some phone calls, and they asked me not to go to Iran. And then uh, when I went back to Iran uh, twice, they stopped me at the airport. They did not arrest me. They stopped me at the airport. They told me that, you know, we know that you're making films for, films for the BBC. You just have to promise that these films are for BBC English. And at that time, I was working on a panorama about the Iranian election in June 2009. And they said that you can make this panorama for BBC English, but it should not be shown on BBC Persian. So the government was somehow worried about BBC Persian TV. They started to harass people, intimidate people every now and then. F filmmakers were sporadically arrested and interrogated because of their connections for BBC TV. But then, as the government tried to consolidate it after the June 2009 election and after the Revolutionary Guards became really in charge of the country, and the government tried to consolidate its grip over different sectors of Iranian society, they were worried about any kind of contact with the outside world. They wanted to cut the flow of the information, flow of information between Iran and the outside world, and outside world and Iran. So uh, they saw BBC as a professional organization as the main threat. So they started to harass people they suspected of working for the BBC. And the BBC did not have, BBC Persian never had anyone working for them full time. As far as I know, 
and that's the position of BBC Persian. I'm not working for BBC Persian. People who are working for BBC Persian can tell you that. But as far as I know, they never had anyone working full time for BBC Persian in Iran. So the Iranian government wanted to intimidate people who were selling their films like any other professional filmmaker for filmmakers for BBC Persian. And last month, apparently BBC Persian television showed a film about Pejak, which is the Iranian branch of PKK, and they talked to some people. And it was a very, uh, I haven't seen it, but apparently it was a very objective view of this terrorist group, and they showed some some of the people who were in that terrorist group and the Iranian government objected to that. And then uh, BBC, I think about uh, three weeks ago, they started to announce this film, which Bozog Meher here uh, directed, uh, which was about Khamenei, uh, supreme leader of Iran, and the main person in Iran. And I think uh, when we are talking about Iranian leaders from now on uh, tonight, you should just forget about Ahmadinejad because he's just a uh, stooge. I mean, he's nothing in, in, uh, in Iran. We should talk about Khamenei. And they don't want to talk about the Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. So when BBC started to advertise the film about Khamenei, uh, the Iranian government started to advertise its threats against the BBC Persian network inside the country. This is unprecedented. It never happened before that they would threaten a group of people, unknown group of people, of an imminent arrest before arresting them. So, uh, and I think that was, uh, that's the, uh, I think that's the perception of many other people that they, th they thought that they could prevent showing this film on uh, BBC Persian. BBC Persian showed it on Saturday, what was the date? Two weeks ago, I mean. Yeah, exactly two, two Saturdays weeks. ago, whatever is tomorrow. Yeah, mm -hmm. just deduct two weeks uh, minus 14. Yeah, and then uh, on Sunday morning, they arrested these five people. They uh, raided their houses. They announced uh, one uh, very small uh, media organization, the Young Reporters Club, announced that they arrested six people. Uh, with their initials only, and that's very typical of the Iranian intelligence that they never mention names, they always mention the initials. And they mention six initials that these people are, have been, are working for, used to work for the BBC Persian service, and they are part of the BBC Persian service network, and uh, they said that, you know, and gradually they started to add to their uh, uh, accusations and charges against these people. They started with working for BBC Persian, then the <laughs> Ministry of Intelligence said that they worked for British Intelligence Agency, also known as the BBC, <laughs> <laughs> and then they charged them with money laundering, which uh, most probably is because uh, they were selling their films to the BBC Persian and they were receiving money through their families uh, because you cannot really uh, send money to Iran from here and BBC cannot do that so they they do that and then you know and then the charges became more ridiculous they said that these people were part of they were communists that uh, the people who are working for BBC Persian they are monarchists terrorists and the, I think, icing on the cake was devil worshippers, you oh, know. I, know. Like that. <laughs> I knew that Mary is not a devil worshipper, but <laughs> no, I don't know. Maybe he does that secretly, who knows. <laughs> yeah. But the people who accused him of doing that, they didn't know. So, yeah, so that is the situation that we are in now. I've been in touch with some of the people who are working for BBC, for Ministry of Culture in Iran, and they are saying that the, there is a decision from the top, most probably from Supreme Security Council of Iran, that BBC Persian B, at, and any mention of Khamenei in a not deified terms has, has to be uh, prevented and BBC Persian has to uh, be prevented from doing these kind of things. And Iranians Iranian filmmakers, they have to be uh, intimidated early enough and they have to basically nip it in the butt and 
the Minister of Culture actually, he said it uh, in exactly those terms that the arrest of these dear filmmakers, I love the dear that he used, these dear filmmakers is a warning for other filmmakers to be m more careful. And the families are intimidated, the families are uh, told not to talk to anyone in the media, especially foreign media, especially BBC, Persian, and Voice of America, or more influential uh, diaspora uh, broadcasters. And also the House of Cinema, which is, as I said, it's a, this institution representing different cinema guilds, uh, that has been uh, vilified in the conservative press by the conservative officials. They've said that the House of Cinema is basically the bastion of foreign enemies and they've asked to review the charter of House of Cinema and the Minister of Culture even said that, you know, we have to review the, House of, the charter of House of Cinema and they may close that. So this is the situation we are in and apparently there will be a meeting between House of Cinema and families. I don't know what will be the result of that, but most probably, as in my case, as in the case of anyone who was arrested in the past, they're going to tell the families that you should be quiet because there are negotiations going on behind the scene, and, this, and if you make any noise, the situation will get worse. Thank you, Mazia. I'm now going to turn to Borzut, who was involved, as uh, Mazia said, with this film, The Ways of the Ayatollah. So maybe you can explain to us a little bit about that film and the connection between that project and these um, five filmmakers. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, there's no connection, uh, just to make it. Okay. But, but I would explain more. I mean, uh, just to put it in the context, after the presidential election in Iran, uh, loads of uh, media and journalists in Iran received a single text that uh, you are not allowed to cover the demonstrations on the street. And I, I remember the one of the journalists, I don't remember the name and I don't remember the, the channel. The, the, broad, uh, the, the reporter put the camera in the office and said that there are millions of people in the street, on the street they are chanting slogans, but I'm not allowed to go out and report on that. And I've received the text that I should stay in this. I, I'm not allowed to leave the office to go and report such a huge event. And watching this uh, piece by uh, uh, Mr. Robadi, it reminds me. Uh, it reminded me of uh, that situation of the journalist in Iran. That they I mean uh, p directors and journalists. They are facing the same situation within the country. That they are not allowed to go on the streets and make their films or make their reports. They have to make it on, at, at their home. The second, second thing that this piece reminded me was making a, a report by a cell phone. And that was what made BBC Persian and VOA and other channels different because although reporters was, were not allowed to go on the streets, we received loads of pictures of the demonstrations and they were UGC materials that people just recorded by their cell phones and send it, send it to us and we reported based on those uh, 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 mobile footages. So just to put it in the context, BBC and loads of other broadcasters always wanted to have an office in Iran to uh, report everyday life of Iranian, politics of Iranian, and to, to, to have a kind of transparent policy to just report everything. And BBC Persian has demanded loads of times to, 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 to have an office in, in Tehran, but uh, this demand haven't been responded to. And regarding, uh, after the, uh, not, after not being su successful of opening an office within Tehran, BBC decided to have a kind of transparent policy that we know by commissioning people in Iran to make reports or documentaries for BBC, we are putting lives of people in danger. That's why we didn't commission anything within the last two years. In the case of these documentary makers, they were independent documentary makers which they sold their documentaries to BBC to be shown on the channel. 
They were not documentary makers who were commissioned to make documentaries for BBC. And loads of these documentaries that these documentary makers made, they've been made maybe six years ago, seven years ago. I mean, before the launch of BBC, which was almost two and a half years ago. And the, these documentaries have been uh, received awards within the country. Some of them have been commissioned by governmental institutions. And the only problem here is that their documentary have been shown on BBC Persian TV just for one time, or maybe I mean, by the repeats two times or something. So, I mean, speaking about my documentary, yeah. I didn't, I, I, I was making a documentary about the Iranian Supreme Leader. And it's so difficult to make a documentary about the main person of a country without having access to, to, to the country. And uh, the, the research took a long time. So <coughs> because we wanted to deliver something with the standard quality of BBC, and we were not allowed to, to go in. So we went and found people who were directly in touch with the Supreme Leader, MPs, former president, the nephew of the, uh, the Supreme Leader, and uh, different relatives and different people, an American hostage who met him about 20, uh, 25 years ago. And that became the base of making the documentary. So regarding the documentary, there, there haven't been any connection with these uh, documentary makers. And uh, they, these documentary makers are independent documentary makers who are making the documentaries. And I should again say that. Uh, for being a documentary maker in Iran is a difficult job because uh, most of the time they don't have the grants of the gov the, the, there is no governmental grants for, for making the documentaries. The, the state TVs won't show their documentaries and that's why some Persian broadcasters which uh, broadcast their, their documentaries are just a few options that they have uh, not to become famous, not to become rich, just to, to survive. And uh, that, that, that's been the case with these documentaries. Let, let me ask you one question before we move on to, to Said. Do you think that the, the broadcast of your documentary, The Ways of the Ayatollah, was that, did that flip them over the edge in some way in terms of anger at BBC Persian? I can't say that, but I can say in the public domain, it's been interpreted as that. Right. And uh, many people see that as a kind of, kind of retaliation of Iranian regime against BBC for showing that documentary. And we had some signals uh, that exactly the moment the documentary start, started to be broadcasted, our satellite was jammed. And exactly the same night that the documentary was on air, they started arresting people. So I, I, I can say it's been interpreted largely. Mm -hmm. that it's but been but just to, to make sure that we've got this clear, none of the five people we're talking about was involved in the making of that documentary? No. No. <coughs> no. Okay. Uh, or any part of other parts of BBC. I mean, on the news, on making documentaries, they are independent documentary makers who have sold their independent documentaries to BBC. I mean, not in this project, not in any other project. I'm friends with three of them, and I know for a fact that three of them at least had nothing to do with BBC and did not sell. I mean, they sold their films to the BBC, yes. but they had nothing to do with BBC. They were not on a retainer, they were not commissioned or anything. Okay. We're going to go to Saeed now. Who, um, Saeed, can you give us a bit of a, a political context in which this is happening because I think this is a good opportunity um, for us to catch up on what's what's happening in Iran, what's the political atmosphere uh, and so on at the moment. Well before going to that, mm. um, talking about human rights, is, um, Iran is now full of <coughs> human rights stories um, which is impossible to cover it's because it's happening on a daily basis really. Um, I reported today um, two Iranian bloggers who committed suicide after mm -hmm. spending a term jail. Um, a few days before was um, Nagas Mohammadi who was sentenced to 11 years 
So um, harassing people is not just limited to filmmakers. And it's happening, the tragedies that is happening in, on a daily basis. Which I think Drury, who Drew, just good. entered. Q, um, gentleman from Amnesty. Drew, do you want to come on up and, and sit? This is Drury Dyke from Amnesty, who we've been waiting for. Sorry. And so, no, no problem at all, Drew. Um, but was you waiting just for the word human rights. Yeah, yeah that's right. The moment sense. we said that. <laughs> so let's, Saeed will we'll finish and then we'll, we'll pass on to, to Drew. Carry on, so Saeed. I, so I want to explain very much about human rights because. No, but that's true. Job. And that's no, he, he's, that's he's true. welcome to do it. He's welcome to do it. Um, so, what is very extraordinary about Iran now, I think, is this power struggle between Khamenei and Ahmadinejad. Although Maziar said Ahmadinejad is now nobody, but he's, we know that the, the winner is Khamenei, but it's still, there's a very extraordinary power, power struggle which people think um, that um, it's a bigger challenge to Khamenei's power. Some people think in comparison to what happened in 2009. So um, we know that everything um, triggered in April, mid-April, when Khamenei intervened um, in, a, in a cabinet appointment by reinstating uh, Musli, who was the intelligence minister, um, back. He, he resigned under pressure from Ahmadinejad, but Khamenei intervened and put him back. And we didn't know at that time uh, why Muslay was important and why, um, what was happening, really. That was the beginning. But now, um, with more of what is happening, especially with this financial scam that has unraveled, um, we might see different bits of this puzzle of, why, of what is happening, really. Um, what financial scam? This uh, two point, yeah, I will explain that. Really. So in April, um, the, the, the confrontation between Ahmadinejad and Khamenei uh, was made public um, after that cabinet, cabinet restatement. And um, Khamenei appeared to be very worried about uh, Ahmadinejad's um, influence in Iran's politics. Um, and also his team, including Mashai, who is the um, controversial chief of staff. Uh, who's, um, now a relative of Ahmadinejad as well. Um, and now, um, and now there is financial scam happening, which the government is um, accused of being involved in. Uh, 2.8, some people say 2.6 billion financial scam, um, banking scam. People know that now it, it appears to be that Muslahi uh, in the intelligence ministry, there is a there is a department, there is a secret uh, de office in charge of monitoring uh, privatization in Iran. And since 2004, um, Iran has started to privatize some state-owned companies. And um, Ahmadinejad wanted to have influence over that office, and uh, Khamenei didn't like that, and that was. Um, what now um, appears to be the reason it happened. So that is, is that part of the essence of the power struggle between Ahmadinejad and, um, and the Supreme Leader? Yep, well there was a very interesting article by Abbas Milani um, mm -hmm. a few um, days ago about a likening um, ah Ahmadinejad Khamenei relationship to Putin and Medvedev. Okay. Like um, uh, Putin having a stooge uh, and being sure that Medvedev would surrender after a few years and him getting back to power. Um, Khamenei wanted to have <coughs> such a stooge relying on Ahmadinejad and think that, thinking that he might surrender after his term finishes. But that's not what we're seeing now. Um, we see that Ahmadinejad has more first for power than people expected and is ready to challenge Khamenei's own supremacy. Um, okay. But, but, that, but that seems to be, um, it would be very interesting if change comes to Iran, not by a street protest, but by an in, in, you know, inside power struggle. By inside power struggle, yes. So basically, I'm <laughs> sorry, I have to add that <laughs> what happened in the, what was shown in the film as well. I'm not sure if the English version is available or not. Uh, on the no, we're internet. working on the subtitle. You're working on yeah. the subtitle. 
anyways, what happened was that it's Khamenei, after Khomeini's death in 1989, became the supreme leader. And in the first 10 years, he was the underdog, the first uh, president during his uh, supreme leadership. He was the main person in Iran. And then in 1997, there was a reformist uh, president who was elected and somehow challenged Khamenei's supreme mm -hmm. leadership. So in 1999, there was a the student demonstration that really challenged Khamenei's uh, supremacy. And at that point, the Revolutionary Guards and Khamenei's office, they realized that they have to start this process of indoctrination, uh, which they call wisdom, uh, Basirati in Persian. And it basically consists of deification of Khamenei, that he is a lost representative of, uh, on Earth. So that he has, he, I mean, according to an uh, Imam of the Friday Prayers, recently in connection with Ahmadinejad said that the supreme leader can tell the president that your wife, you have to divorce your wife, and the president has to divorce his wife. So I don't know if the supreme leader is going to marry her or whatever, but that was not <laughs> explained. But that is the kind of uh, power that they are attributing to a supreme leader. So in this process of deification, uh, Khamenei in 2005 chose someone who he thought was obsequious and someone who mm. would uh, just uh, serve his supreme leadership, he backed him, Ahmadinejad. But then, of course, like every little monster that you create, they want to become <laughs> big monsters, you know. <laughs> and, you know, and Ahmadinejad, after his re-election, which was supported by Khamenei mm. again, uh, he started to rebel against his master and his maker and that was somehow reflected in the film. But these are supposed to be uh, the open secrets, and they should mm. not be talked openly. But when BBC talked about that, it was the, it's somehow a knee-jerk reaction by the government that, you know, if you don't take part in this deifying, deification process, you will be punished. And how many okay. very successfully has managed to keep secret all these um, personal, his personal lives. We, mm. we know very little about his personal life, who is who are in this space, uh, Rahbari, who are in the leader's house. So it's astonishing, actually, that after 20 years mm. in his leadership, people in the opposition has not been able to penetrate in that, um, mm. in that yeah. compound. Compound would be nice. Um, okay. Uh, Can I, I want to stop you there, side because I want to, to pass to, to Drew now, and then we'll come back in questions. Drew Dyke from, from Amnesty has just joined us. Um, at the beginning, Drew, um, we had a, a summary of what, what had happened to the uh, five filmmakers, but maybe you could bring us up to date on the latest news that you hear, and also give us a, the human rights context in which this is happening. As for the... The five filmmakers, or five plus one if you include an actress uh, who was detained in June and indeed um, others who are under house arrest, I'm afraid we have very little news. I speak to the lawyers uh, of, of one of them, Jafar Panahi, from time to time. Uh, but as for the five, very little. Um, uh, the Human Rights Challenge, I think um, Saeed Mazyar have indeed touched on. And it's the challenge that, that I think we're facing, we try to unpack day in, day out, is, is to know, to work out where the cleavages are um, in the authorities in order to try and prize one off the other. And it's much more difficult now than it was when I joined Amnesty International when President Hatimi was in power. Much more difficult. And the, the closure of, for example, the Beit Rahbari, the office, of the Supreme Leader is an example, is a case in point. In previous years, for example, if there was a case of, for example, two AIDS doctors, uh, doctors uh, Arash uh, Alai, for example, we might be able to approach Dr. Velayati, Ali Akbar Velayati, who was the former foreign minister, and, and, and maybe he'd be willing to put in a good word or try to do something, but we don't find that now. There's no traction. We can't. You know, whereas we'd be able to speak to Etelaatis, the, the people in the, um, in, the, 
intelligence ministries or one of the intelligence ministries where we might have some, as I say, traction with some of these people. It's nothing now. And it's, so it's very, very difficult. Well, we find one, for example, might be uh, the kind of normal court structures in the provinces, the province of Tehran, the head of the Tehran courts, um, and indeed the head of the, uh, one of the, the provinces, East Azerbaijan provinces, one of the heads of their courts, vis-a-vis -vis the kind of political structure. But that's been reduced now too because of the instrumentalization of the judiciary. The judiciary has become a tool of, uh, uh, in, in, in many respects, in large, you know, across the board really, in, so, in some areas, of the, particularly the Beit al-Rahbari and, uh, and those interests. So it's, it's become very... Can you explain what the Beit al-Rahbari is? The, so the Supreme know. Leader's office, the people yeah. around, you know, what is in fact a, a shadow government, but in fact is, you know, sending out its own representatives and so on and made avail. We have a... Representative of the Supreme Leader is, com you know, is accountable. Iranian equivalent of Kremlin. Yeah, yeah. And uh, mm. it's, a, it's quite an astonishing setup. The one thing that I guess we haven't explored, and it's difficult for us, we work within a, in a rather legalistic uh, fashion. We, we, we like to adhere to the normal procedures, almost diplomatic channels, and so on and so forth. But there's some of the more campaign minded of, uh, of, of Amnesty's members uh, have pitched up in Made Avail at the at the, 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 uh, the religious center, former Bingo Hall, former Mecca, if I'm not mistaken, um, <laughs> to, you know, to make, uh, make, make the case to that particular individual, and indeed in the big mosque in Hamburg, the other, the other representatives of the Supreme Leader, and some are vying to make the same sort of action in Iran, and I, I think maybe domestically you'll find this too, is that the, the Supreme Leader has envoys in large factories and, uh, and there's those who are accountable to the Supreme Leader's office in, uh, in universities and so on, and the Haras and the representatives of the Haras and the, the kind of di disciplinary forces within it. And we, we haven't really explored that, you know, what, it, what does it mean? Because they're totally unaccountable. They are totally unaccountable to anyone. Um, Can I pull you back to ask you a question about this? So we have these five filmmakers arrested after this BBC film to which they are unconnected has been shown but which has obviously angered the authorities and they do have a connection to BBC in that their films have been shown on BBC. Does their arrest come directly from the Supreme Leader's office do you believe? Is it from the Revolutionary Guard? Is it Explain to us in as much as and I understand that these processes are uh, opaque. Opaque, absolutely opaque. I, but what is your understanding? I, I can't say. I couldn't say. I mean, maybe Mazia uh, might hmm. be or, or, or Sai, but I, I, I mean, I don't know um, who hmm. it would come from. But there does seem to be at some level a high degree of consensus for a, an arrest or a series of arrests such as those. The other arrests that take place that are maybe analogous of certain student activists, for example, or ones that happen in series, they, they have a certain uniformity um, that, that, makes, uh, that actually makes it far more difficult to cam campaign on. Um, <coughs> in the end, we're, we look to the outside, uh, mm -hmm. to those who are friendly with Iran, to say that's it's not good. Uh, not in a dissimilar fashion uh, that the, um, the, these American, two American people, hikers, uh, mm. Josh Vatal, um, and um, Shane Bell. Thank you. Um, that they use those those sort of kind of using intermediaries, uh, the, the president of Iraq, uh, Oman. I mean, not to say that we would use them, but um, but it's certainly reaching that point. Okay. Uh, before we go any further, I'm told that there's another film. Uh, this is a film by everybody's favorite TV station. That's Press TV. Um, I have no idea what's in it, but I'm told that that's what we're going to watch now. So. Um, does it need any other introduction, Masio? I have no idea. It's we have no I'm idea. Sure it's riveting. Yeah, yeah, go on, put it on, Roxana. Let's have a look. Iran's judicial authorities have arrested six people over working covertly for the British Broadcasting Corporation's Persian language service. They say the Iranian filmmakers were supplying the BBC with content, including films that depict the country in a negative way. Also, according to the intelligence minister, the detainees were paid tens of thousands of dollars for each of their programs. The government has found important information in light of the arrests. 
which serve as further evidence that political intelligence gathering is high on BBC's agenda. <coughs> the Iranian government has banned citizens for working with anti-Iran foreign radio and television networks, especially the BBC and the Voice of America. The BBC has denied that the six Iranian defendants are its employees, describing them instead as independent filmmakers. The defendants are the members of the Iranian Alliance of Motion Picture Guilds. The Alliance has issued a statement in their defense, but they also complain that their statement has become politicized. As far as I know, the Iranian Alliance of Motion Picture Guilds hasn't received any directive which says its members cannot sell their productions to foreign TV channels. The guilds act within the framework of the law, and if there is such a law, our members will respect it. The Iranian Alliance of Motion Picture Guild says it has no business with those who want to tarnish the image of Islamic Republic. The Alliance has also condemned those who are trying to misrepresent the contents of its statement. Under Article 37 of the Iranian Constitution, no one is guilty until proven otherwise at the court of law. In our statement, we have simply urged the authorities to take this article into consideration. However, we are confident that the Iranian justice system is fair and impartial, and it will act accordingly when investigating the case against our colleagues. The board members of the Iranian Alliance of Motion Picture Guilds are of the opinion that this is not the first time that certain foreign media outlets are trying to take advantage of the situation in Iran. They also warn that this is not going to be the last one. Aman Odiri, Press TV, Tehran. Thank you. That, um, for those who don't know, Press TV is obviously an arm of the Iranian government. It's a bit like Russia Today or any of these, um, these international um, channels, which is presenting the point of view of the Iranian government. So I think what we should do now is open this up for discussion and questions. And I, I say there's a couple of things which I think we should look at. One is the more the broader human rights situation in in Iran, and maybe Drew may be able to help us more on that. But also the issue, obviously, about um, what can we do, what um, can anyone do? Because that I think is extremely difficult. Side, so, you want to say something before yeah, I open it up? Uh, you asked um, Drew about who arrested the filmmakers. Um, I just want to say I just I recently read a letter um, written by um, the wife of, a, of of some of an activist who has been arrested for the past six months. And this wife has received a letter from the intelligence, uh, from the judiciary, mm -hmm. asking um, the husband to report to the judiciary and to the prison, to go back to the prison. So the, the, the activist who is now in jail has been sent a letter to... All right, so, they, so the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing? No, no, the, thing, the, the guy is in jail. Yes. And now the wife of the guy has received a letter from the judiciary. Yeah. Should, you should represent yourself. To the, you should go to the jail. Yeah. He's still in jail. Mm. So, yeah. so pe the people in the judiciary, yeah, they, don't know, they yeah. don't know that the, the guy is still in the, jail. Yeah, so they don't, yeah, exactly. So, so they don't know. So it's very funny that sometimes people are arrested by the government, sometimes mm. by the revolutionary guards, sometimes by the... Just because it's a police yeah. state doesn't mean that they're also, well organized. Yeah, also I think yeah, uh, regarding who arrested these people or whether mm. Uh, Khamenei himself gave uh, the order. Mm. Uh, I don't. I mean, it can be something from his mm. uh, house, his institution, but it can be also uh, someone uh, from the government, part of the government. Yes. Because when you create a system that there is one person at the top of the pyramid, everyone basically, everyone's uh, job, everyone's duty mm -hmm. is to serve that person, and people sometimes compete with each other in order to serve that person even if even yes. though sometimes that's counterproductive and so in this case we are hearing different things that there is this institution that was jealous of some of these fi filmmakers there's another theory that someone had a grudge against these people uh, I love but for a fact <laughs> but we know for a fact that uh Khamenei can release these filmmakers tomorrow if he wants, if to, he wants to but he hasn't done that for the past two weeks. Okay, um, I would just say on questions, <coughs> if you give your name, affiliation if you have one, 
short comment on question or question <coughs> those who rant will be treated very harshly <laughs> and I know some of the ranters in this audience <laughs> lady there uh, is it on hold it close to you yeah I think it is turning on and then <coughs> try again no it's still a bit not working do we have another microphone or else we're gonna have to shout we can repeat that if you want. Well, I can repeat your question or you yeah. can shout. Okay. I'm Mary Zashinshik, so... Um, Try again. I have a question to Nazia. I'm sorry if I... Masia. 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 <coughs> I will mispronounce your name too. <laughs> <laughs> I just, sorry, couldn't understand why um, Iranian government doesn't... I mean, it doesn't bother to support Iranian government to support the things that are shown uh, in BBC English, but rather in BBC Persian, because mm. it's obvious that when it's on audience, including Persians, and yeah. it has more effect in, on yeah. international comments. Sure, good question. Just yeah. to repeat, in case people didn't hear that, <laughs> uh, the question was, why are they so bothered about BBC Persian far more than BBC English, when BBC English would reach a wider audience? Yeah, because the, there is a wider audience around the world, but inside Iran, there are not that many people. I mean, there is a smaller percentage who speak English. And uh, something that's aired by BBC Persian or another Persian channel reaches a wider audience. And even though satellite channels are illegal in Iran, they are all over the country. I've even seen some uh, nomads who have satellite channels. And it's, it's just the, the usage is uh, so widespread that uh, it can, you know, it, it's, influ it's very influential. But also, I think you have to uh, uh, take it into consideration that this government is a very 20th century dictatorship. It hasn't come to grips with the technological advancement. It is a government that knows how to defeat shortwave radio and terrestrial channels. It doesn't know what to do exactly with the internet with uh, social network sites and as such it's it, it still doesn't know what to do with the English channels and you know they're I mean they're educating themselves and they're getting better they're hacking Twitter and different networks but it takes them a while to do that so for the moment or in the, in two years ago when I was uh, two years ago when I uh, was telling you about they had not realized that you know the English programs could have uh, an effect on Iranians. So they concentrated more on Persian channels. Okay. Um, yes, and Leslie. Yes, and Leslie. Um, until fairly recently, for Asian infirmity. To IN of the no, British no, Press Corps. Lindsay, do shut up. Um, <laughs> 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 which is very flattering, which is excessively so. I just feel. How many satraps? You know, always <laughs> saying wonderful things about. Them. But um, the two interesting things. One, which we're talking about, Mazia, which is they're catching up. But what is astounding about this country is how bad they are at PR. Mm. And the story <laughs> of you know this Christian pastor, which of course has swept the world. I mean, why why are they so bad? Because you know Persians you know, are very good at, um, you know, smoke and mirrors and everything, they are terribly bad at that. But the more important and substantive thing is, how do you think they're coping with what's going on in Syria? Mm. As we know that Syria has been an enormous and useful ally to them. And do, do they comment on it? Are they trying to come to terms with what's going on there? I'd love to know that. Okay, um, I'm just going to take one more question um, from Fazal there, um, and then I'm going to put some of those ones to, to you, side. Um, just there, right? No, no, not Potkin. No, Potkin's a ranter, he can come oh. later. Fazal, <laughs> um, who's just next to you, just there. Um, Your yes. reputation. Yeah, yes, let's make a good point. Our world. Our world, uh, yeah, our world is a documentary section of BBC World. Those interviews that we've yeah. seen with those people who were shown there. Yeah. But just one uh, yes, point about the, uh, now that you talk about Press TV, there was a letter um, about, written about four or five weeks ago 
about, it was very critical, he was written um, in a website associated with the Revolution of Guards, and I think Potkin wrote something about it. Um, and he was very critical of press TV and the way they dealt with the London and the UK riots. That was very and, funny. and they were saying that they've spent 25 million mm. pounds on mm. press TV and they were not very effective in the same propaganda as they said yeah. that BBC Persian was kind of effective in terms of 2009 election. So I thought that was... Kind of yeah, and I think that comes back to Anne's point about PR. Said, uh, uh, can I put you the, Anne's question about Syria? How has what's going on in Syria been reported in Iran? And do, do you see it having... What impact, if any, do you see it having? Well, um, from the beginning of this pro-democracy movements in the um, region, Iran initially supported the pro-democracy movements especially in Tunisia and later in Egypt, especially in Egypt because of Mubarak, which they hated because of Shah's um, uh, living there. And then, um, and the hypocrisy was highlighted when it came to Syria. And also Bahrain and Yemen helped them because they supported the movements there because, because of the sh Shia thing. But um, Syria was a place when they hesitated. But Khamenei from the beginning, even from Tunisia and Egypt, try to portray the whole uprising as an Islamic awakening, <laughs> something um, like the, uh, that reflects the 1979 revolution that now is coming to the region, um, especially because Mubarak was very supported by the United States, so there were some similarities. But the, the whole thing in the, in the region was more similar to Iran in 2009 than Iran in, 2000, in, in 1979. Um, there, the the position on Syria, I think, is um, it depends who is who is commenting on Syria and Iran. If uh, well, Khamenei hasn't spoken about Syria publicly, um, but Ahmadinejad has changed his tone a bit. In the beginning, um, he was very pro-Assad, and now he's talking about dialogue. He's he's, he's yet pro-Assad, but he's also talking about uh, the necessity of speaking with the people. Um, it was reported that um, Ahmadinejad has called on Syria to end violence, which I think was not <laughs> properly um, reported. Um, I think they're trying to, they're still, because well, Syria is their only ally, really. So, if, assume that if uh, Syria falls yeah. and um, the, oh, the movement goes back, to goes to Iran, where Khamenei has to go, really, if, mm. if, if, if Iran falls. Um, Okay, let me put it, Matthew, are, you, are they embarrassed by what's happening in Syria or is it just an inconvenience? Well, I think they will, they're really threatened by what's happening in Syria because of Syria's strategic alliance with Iran and the fact that Syria is the main route to Hezbollah and Hamas. And they're also not very happy because that in this regional uh, power struggle, Saudi Arabia is helping the Syrian opposition much more than any other country. So uh, the Iranians, they are between uh, rock and hard place and many other things because on one hand, uh, if Syria falls, it's going to inspire Iranian people the same way that the Iranians were inspired by the mm -hmm. fall of Mubarak and Ben Ali in Tunisia. And also because it's going to damage their relationship with Hezbollah and Hamas. The, that actually, the relationship with Hamas has already be, been damaged because Saudi Arabia gives more money to Hamas than Iran. So Iranians were complaining about Hamas's uh, neutrality in this power struggle between Assad and his opposition. And then also, Iranians are very much afraid of Saudi in future influence in Syria because Saudis, after the fall of Mubarak and the way that the disgraceful way that they perceived uh, Obama administration treated uh, Mubarak, they have a very independent, a more independent policy in the Gulf, in the Persian Gulf mm -hmm. region, and they are supporting, they have their own policy more than, you know, in previously that they were more in line with the Americans. And go back, going back to your question about why they're so bad in PR, I think it lies in the fact that in the name of the government, the form of the government, it's the Islamic Republic. So it's, a, it's an oxymoron, you know. It's like if you ask someone, 
you know, if you have a, someone called an exciting accountant, you know, an accountant, <laughs> no, come on, you know, can it be, you know, <laughs> how can it, you know, <laughs> it's like that. I know, and, it's very you know, it's like it's that. But I mean, it's, um, yeah, yes. maybe there are, I apologize to accountants here. But I mean, if a government says that it's an Islamic, then it has to abide by certain rules. And then if it's a republic, it has to abide by other rules. And each of those attributions, they have their own uh, power base inside the country. So when the Islamic Republic does something that reminds people of a republic, that Islamic contingent starts to uh, rise against it. When it does the Islamic part, it, the other part. So it's and it, this internal struggle between Ahmadinejad and Khamenei, Ahmadinejad tries to try to be on the side of the republic side mm. and Khamenei the uh, yes, Islamic nice. side. But Khamenei cannot do that because he is not a qualified Grand Ayatollah. <laughs> so he lacks that Islamic qualification. So I'm okay. sorry, that's okay. more confusing. No, no, than it's it's clear, clear, but, Look, know, if you're yeah. not confused when you're talking about Iran, it means you're getting nowhere. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Polkin, you are allowed to talk for two minutes. <laughs> two questions. One from Marzia. I just wanted to know what's the latest on your complaint to Ofcom about Press TV? What's the latest outcome of that? Um, then I want to come back to what Drury said about running out of people to talk to in Iran. And I just want to say that we had a golden opportunity recently when Ahmadinejad came to UN and he was being interviewed by US anchormen. Mm. To my knowledge, not one of them uh, brought up the plight of the BBC documentary makers or any of the imprisoned journalists We're not supposed to call them BBC documentary makers. We've just had a whole panel telling us that they are do independent documentary makers. Sorry, you're right. The, the, the people who were accused of being BBC mm. documentary makers. But none of the US anchormen uh, uh, brought that up or mm. brought any question about any of the uh, hundreds of imprisoned journalists in Iran. And uh, mm. do journalists have a responsibility to stand up for their own colleagues? Do you okay, well, that's a second interesting well, what, what question. Yeah. Uh, no, that wasn't, that was very good. True. You said you were going to say something about who to talk to, right? Yeah. It was, it was a golden opportunity because Ahmadinejad was in UN. He was being interviewed by a US anchorman. One of them could, brought, could have brought up about the question of imprisoned mm. journalists in Iran and, you know, put them on the, on the spot. I, mean, I think it's, I'm, I regret to say, I think it's kind of incumbent upon us to try and inform them better. I was watching, um, an interview, an old interview of Christian Amanpour with uh, with Javad Larajani, the head of the so-called mm. um, uh, human rights headquarters or the, the 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 High Council for Human Rights in Iran, it was supposed to be the the kind of the, the 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 coordinating body for Iran's responses on international human rights issues, including domestic, really. And Christian Amanpour was uh, speaking to him about a range of things, of course, and one of them was the death penalty, mm. and. Um, you know, we're trying to do some work at the moment on Afghans, Afghans facing um, the death penalty in Iran for drug trafficking. And interestingly, Jawad Larajani said, well, I'm against it because basically, you know, they're, they're trafficking drugs to uh, Europe and it's really Europe that should pick up the tab. And he said, well, you know, if it's, if it's between 15 and 18, maybe we could sort of execute them. And Amanpour didn't no disrespect to her. Didn't really sort of come back and say, well, actually, you know, international human rights standards say, you know, 18 is the absolute minimum. It's a sort of unconditional thing. And it, it is a bit disappointing. It's enormously disappointing. And I mean, Potkin, you're totally right that, that, uh, that, that, you know, there was a huge letdown on these, those opportunities for those interviews uh, to, to, to um, in a way, push forward the, the case for human rights and a case for transparency. Um, can I say, um, I, I think, I mean, I, I take your point, Pocket. Um, I have not interviewed Ahmadinejad myself, but people have. It's a bit like trying to catch a fish with your hands, you know? At the moment you come anywhere near something. But <laughs> may, may I He's up there. Yes, please. That's, I think it, it, there's not, not a mischance, because the, 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 the answer of Ahmadinejad is quite clear. Mm. So I would say the judiciary system in our country is, in, is yes. an independent system. He has been asked that um, for the yes. house arrest of Musavi and Karubi, mm. and he has said that. And I think interviews are not a chance. Interviews yeah, are work. chance in democratic countries, for example, like, I don't know, I, let's not mention any country. When people, when they, <laughs> yeah. when they say something, they are accountable for that. Yes. But most of the time, Ahmadinejad, for example, had said things that he, for example, he said, 
recently they asked him about the situation of Kavubi and Musavi, the heads of opposition. He said they asked him about the house arrest of these people and he said no, they are free, they can go everywhere they want. And in, in you, you might say it's a chance, but uh, if people in interviews are not saying the truth, what, 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 there, there's no chance. Well, there's it's, no it's, it's, it's They're not accountable for. Let me come, come back. Okay, you. But can I say before I give you the microphone, uh, you have form, <laughs> and I do not want you to insult the panel and accuse them of being bad Muslims and bad Shi, which is what you did last time. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so briefly. Uh, he wants. Uh, he wanted to know what the press I, TV thing. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll come back to that. Sorry. I come yeah. Back, yeah. yeah. Uh, do you have attended so many meetings about Iran? Yes. Nobody has given me a historical background. If you look at the civilization in 1609 mm. and further on, why they have become so theocratic and difficult? We know Saudi Arabia, Wahhabis, Salafis, uh, Islamic yes. places. All. We know Al Qaeda, who thinks that still West is carrying out the, the same crusade is spent as such. We know that, but nobody has explained to me why uh, the uh, Iran behaves in such a way. What is the reason? Ninety percent are devout Shias, and uh, the, it is impossible. You see, these young people here, uh, they are more than they think. You see, they can mm -hmm. evolve, evolve. It's not going to be like that at all. So long as there is ninety percent of Shias are devout and they feel Right. Die or the Mahdi's will come, you see, and okay. save. And so this argument about the, I know they are following some of the recently I saw a film of separation, you see. Okay, fine. Um, I'm <laughs> going to recommend a book for you to read, and I, so you come and see me afterwards, and I'm going to write down the title, because I, ha I know a very, very good book which will answer your question. Back. Right, I'm sorry. Um, Podkin, just quickly, because Podkin did ask, um, Mazi, Mazia has a complaint to, against Press TV, which maybe briefly you can explain to us. Yeah, basically what happened was that uh, when I was in prison, Press TV came and they interviewed my forced confession and they showed the program and they, port they portrayed my forced confession as an interview in that. And when I came out, uh, I t uh, challenged Press TV and I complained about that broadcast uh, at Ofcom. Ofcom accepted my uh, complaint, and the sanction is not clear yet. We are not. We don't know what's going on, and we have no idea. Yeah, exactly. The sanction, as they call it, pardon? It took about a year and a half to accept my complaints. I may be wrong with the legal. My wife is a lawyer. <laughs> She's looking at me <laughs> strangely. She's, she knew. What? It took too long. The legal yeah, opinion it is it took too long. long. Yeah. But yeah, but they, anyways, they accepted the uh, complaint, but they're thinking about the sanctions. I'm not sure. But I think with the case of the news of the world, being handed over to Afghan, they have more than they may be busy. Place, yeah. Okay. Uh, right. Yes. Yeah. Mm, I think the the panel. Uh, Sorry. Can you give us your name, sir? Uh, my name is Jahed. Uh, I think the panel is regarded the, the accusation and the, the arrest of the filmmakers to to uh, mm, a film, a documentary film showed by the BBC about the supreme leader. But I think uh, the, the the reason, the official, according to official documentation and the statements of the Iranian government, the accusation is for uh, a TV, a film program called uh, Apparat, which the host of the program is sitting among the, us, Mr. Hassan Soljou. And uh, I think there is a, 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 a severe uh, threat uh, to, to, threat to, 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 to the documentary filmmakers in Iran for selling their films to the BBC Persian for this program. And um, I, uh, my question is to the BBC uh, people who are here, uh, uh, if they want to show the, the, their films, the films that they already uh, bought from those filmmakers or not. Uh, you. So you're asking whether the BBC is good, but they've already shown them, haven't they? Yes, but, but from now, but because they have got the, the permission, the, 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 the copyright of the film. So, so it's there are, there are plenty of films, as far as I know, that they already bought. Uh, Hassan, Hassan yeah. can, can speak about that. I think 
explain it, I think. Thank you. Okay. Well, should we, um, it's Hassan from Opera here. I'm going to let Sina, if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to give the microphone to Sima. To Sima, okay. Who's the head of programs? Okay, so let's, uh, that's, a, that's a question which is going to go to the, uh, the head of programs for BBC Persian um, here, and he can... Uh, uh, no, uh, I think uh, we need to talk about the films on a case-by-case -case basis, and yes. uh, this is not the best place to okay. discuss how uh, we are going to plan for our program. What I want to mention and uh, reiterate what uh, Maziar said and Bozok said about the um, documentary makers is uh, no documentary maker, no Iranian documentary maker has been commissioned by BBC. None of them uh, were doing that on a commission. We were not involved in any production and uh, we don't hold a copy uh, copyrights of any of the films. We just have a license to broadcast, and uh, we are not allowed to use those uh, shots of the do those documentaries in our wider output. So as Bozork said, none of the, uh, these documentaries or any other documentary that has been shown in BBC Persian in the past two, ha two and a half years have been used to uh, produce uh, in-house material, including Bozork's film. Yeah, but let me ask, but I'd like to ask a question of, of both of you, which is what do you do now? Because the point is that you need content for your TV station. And it now seems that anybody who sells material to you, even if it hasn't been commissioned, which frankly, the issue of whether it's commissioned or not, I understand that, most people in this room understand that, but that is actually quite a sort of complicated technical thing as far as many people in Iran, or certainly the Iranian government, um, would choose to be aware, it's the same thing. So are you at a point where you really can't show films, documentary films, to which you have the rights because you may endanger other people? At the moment, we are showing the program Apparat called Projector, which showcases Iranian and uh, regional documentaries. It is ongoing. Uh, there, um, as BBC has said, we are deeply concerned about the situation of documentary makers. But uh, um, unlike what mm, my friend and colleague Pavis Jha had said, uh, they are not accused, or they are not charged because they, um, the official charge is not selling the documentaries to BBC. The official charge is cooperation with BBC, which has no basis, and it's not true. And there is a debate in Iran between uh, the union, the House of Cinema, and, the, and parts of the government about the legality of any charge regarding selling of the films. And some of those films, the rights, the broadcasting rights belong to uh, um, foreign distributors. I think Mazia knows the market much better than me, and he can clarify on that. Yeah, so even the rights doesn't sure. belong to some of those filmmakers who have been arrested. Uh, okay, but then I want to come, come to Paul's, I mean, because how do, you, how do you continue to operate? If this can happen to people who are not working for you, but have sold material to you, how, how can you continue? Uh, exactly as we did uh, within the last two years. Within the last two years, we didn't commission anybody within the country to, to uh, make any documentary or any report for us. But we believe by being a credible channel, people will send their documentaries, their reports, their pictures, even their mobile footage to us to, to be aired. Regarding some uh, re in reports and news, of course, we, uh, we consider the security of these people. We will try to, to, to help them uh, uh, to, to uh, and we, we most of the time we tell them that uh, this is the, the, the situation. We, m most of the time we advise them not to uh, send those material to us, but we can't stop that. The, the BBC emails are loads of huge materials and mm. pictures that I, I, I think this is the, uh, the point of being a credible channel within the country. Of course, BBC, uh, of course, there would be documentary makers who would, will come to BBC to, to sell the documentaries to us. BBC won't uh, stop these buying of documentaries. Right. And, uh, but I think regarding the documentaries that we have bought from these documentary makers, I think although we have the rights to show them, I mean legally, yes. but I think because of the, the, the current situation, of course, we would uh, uh, 
call the, their families and we will con we consider the, the situation. If they right. are happy, we will show them. If not, we, we might shelf them for later. But I think for m more details, Hassan, can, Hassan is the head of uh, the editor of the, right. the, the, the program pr projector. Is this Hassan in the green shirt? Go on, Hassan, can you, can you uh, give us your perspective? It's all blame on me. Um, it's all your fault. <laughs> yeah, of course it is. Um, as my colleagues said, basically we are uh, continue buying documentaries from here and there. And may I add something? First of all, these films, which uh, the filmmakers have already been accused of actually uh, making for BBC have been made like ages ago, even ages before BBC television has been created. When were they made? When were these films made? Uh, by Iranian filmmaker inside the country. They have been actually awarded inside the country and some of those people have been actually working with the with the governmental bodies. One of them who have been arrested have a sort of uh, awarded as the best, uh, as uh, owning the best export company in terms of cultural things, which is really interesting. And in terms of uh, the other, uh, we, are, we are at the moment, we are having, I can call it a movement of uh, making documentaries inside Iran and young people are going and just mm. making it and uh, with the, this um, uh, new the wave of the technology, digital films, they're making very, very interesting documentaries and they keep sending this to us and they want us to show those films. And on the other hand, the thing is, most of these films haven't been actually bought through directly through Iranian the filmmakers or documentary makers. We have bought them through distributors around the world. So, m personally, I don't know many of these filmmakers. They, they, they just talk to some distributors around the world, and the distributing companies mm -hmm. have been selling to films to us, to many other channels. And these films have been in uh, another Persian channels as well, interestingly. Okay, Look, can, I, can I just come, I want to come, come back to, to Drew on this. So we have, these filmmakers have been arrested. They've been connected to the BBC uh, by the authorities and we understand that that connection is tenuous to say the least. Drew, why do you think these five people were arrested then? I, is there something at the heart of this that we're not understanding? I'm still concerned at what, <coughs> what uh, Hassan said about dis distributors. I'm, I fear now that we're going to see a round of arrests of distributors um, and now that that's, that's, uh, that's been said. Mm. Um, they're around the world. They're not in Iran, so they're right. Okay, I'm trying to get to the heart of yeah. why, why did we think, think why did this happen? What is a distributor, actually, one of these films? Yeah. 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 Um, in, in part, it comes, I think, of, of Anne's uh, the point that Anne made as well about, you know, why did, you know, how do they manage to get such a bad press? There's this remarkable autarky move towards autarky by the authorities, you know, it's, it's after the election, even before the election, indeed, mm. but certainly after the election, the sort of comprehensive uh, publications of lists you know you will not deal with OSI you'll not deal with human rights watch you'll not deal with you know reams of organizations and it seems to also to dovetail with why why is the Persian media so much more important than than other language there's this kind of closing in on itself a closing off of any connections with others that's it's, it's a m remarkable way of shooting itself in the foot but it's I, I, I don't know the answer to your question, but the finding the, um, the, the, the answer to what is behind this astonishing move towards cutting itself off from the outside world, I think might, there might be something in that. We, we don't understand that, but certainly this lot had this alleged connection to something else. Um, you know, it, 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 but I, okay, let me, maybe I didn't for Matthew. What, by doing this, were they trying to get these five people for some reason that we haven't yet discussed in this meeting? Or were these five people arrested as a complicated way of getting at the BBC Persian to make the BBC Persian feel guilty and responsible and stop them broadcasting? Well, uh, three of these five filmmakers, there are prominent uh, people in the documentary world in Iran. One of them is an international distributor. She's very well respected all around the world by all different channels. So my guess is that it's a combination of different factors that, like my own arrest, mm. they wanted to send a message to a variety of people, distributors, filmmakers, journalists, that if you deal with the BBC, uh, this can happen to you. And that is what some, uh, the Minister of Culture said that himself, that these dear filmmakers, you know, what happened to these dear filmmakers is a warning to the other people. 
But at the same time, like any closed system, it's very difficult to know why these five filmmakers were arrested and not other filmmakers. But I think the, uh, there is a more important issue here that the Iranian government is really shooting itself in the foot because these people, they are, I mean, I, I know three of them mm -hmm. quite well. I know one of them relatively well. I don't know the other one, but I know that they are very uh, careful people. They know the culture. They, they wouldn't do anything that was illegal in Iran. Yes. And these people, they were showing their films to Hassan's program, or they were showing their films to different distributors to be sold to the BBC, to BBC Persian with their names. The government could just ask them to not to sell it mm. to uh, them or saying that you know you have to get it back from them it was the same thing that I had the same warning that mm. and you know I sold my film before uh, the elections to three of my films to uh, Apparat program which is edited by Hassan and I asked Hassan not to show those films because I was warned mm. by uh, mm. people in the intelligence but now these arrests and this kind of outlandish exaggerated accusations like you know espionage money laundering devil worshiping it it shows that there is it's a knee jerk reaction it's something irrational and it's also counterproductive at the end for the Iranian government because people want to express themselves one way or another if they cannot put their names on mm -hmm. their films and show it in an official channel they're using their mobile phones, um, right. and, you know, and they're mm -hmm. sure citizen journalism will be uh, more popular, and then there will be smaller satellite dishes they can transmit that. And you know, a few years ago, Iranian Iranian government and someone like Dr. Velayati and you know former President Rafsanjani, they were talking about Iran becoming like China, mm -hmm. but now Iran is becoming more like North Korea, <laughs> which is. Yeah. I don't think that it's in the nature of Iranians to be like North Korea, and that's, that is, a, I think, the sign of a demise of this system in the near future. Okay, right. I'm going to go to Coco, and then I want to, to, to wrap up with something. So, yes, Coco. Just, um, say, say who you are. Coco Ferguson, I used to live in Iran. But, I mean, just going back to North Korea. Hold the microphone up. Hello. Um, just going back to the North Korea point, I was feeling really depressed. I guess about earlier um, earlier this year that Iran had gone cold. It was about North Korea. They weren't listening anymore. Um, but then, and especially with you know the hikers being in prison for so long. But the fact that the hikers were given eight years and then let out a week later was exactly the same as what happened to Roxanne Sarbury. Mm. And it actually made me think, oh, maybe this theatre is alive and well. And actually, they're not so North Korea. Mm -hmm. it, it's very complicated, but they do care more than I'd thought still about what the outside world thinks. Mm -hmm. And this seems yeah. to be a bit part of that. And I was wondering, do you really think North Korea, or actually do they remain as obsessed by how they're seen as they were before? It's just complicated, which would be more optimistic in terms of outsiders' influence. Okay, no, I so I think that's a, to, before you come to that, Matthew. Okay, Claire, you wanted to... Oh, same, same okay, in that case, we won't come to you. Sarah. <laughs> Um, Sarah Cork, Channel 4 News. This is a question because I'm sure most people in this room tweet, blog, everything. Should we, um, in terms of safety of, of activists in Iran and the families of, of these um, filmmakers, should we be contacting families? Should we be broadcasting interviews with them? Uh, can you give us a guidance on that? And uh, also, I know that um, in certain countries, certain uh, media um, uh, trigger response, and for instance in Bahrain, they're very active on Twitter, is there a particular media that uh, triggers a response from the Iranians? Can you give us any guidance on that? Okay, okay. we're going to wrap up now because I, and I want to, to move from Sarah's question, which is, in a sense, what to do and what not to do. Because I think that one of the things that Drury said was how difficult it is as amnesty to know what levers to pull. So, first of all, on, on um, Sarah's question, what should we as a journalist do and not do, and what triggers responses? Um, sorry, can I start with you? Yeah, well, for me, I think it, um, it differs case by case, really. Mm. And you have to use your own judgment. Um, uh, there have been cases that I've talked to, I've phoned people. I phoned, and I guess, Mahamadi, for example, this week with my report. And I felt um, she's got 11 years. So I just can, I might be able to help her to get it a bit low, not, nothing more really can happen. Mm. There are people who lost their family members and then 
it can get worse for them. So they're ready to talk. And there are people who you think, I was spoken to a lawyer, for example, recently, and I felt that um, by naming the lawyer, although she was, or he was um, willing to um, give me the permission to, to use the name, it wasn't, um, it wasn't a good idea to use the name. So I think it differs case to case, um, and now because we are in a very complicated situation. And there has been cases that mostly I think international pressure works, but we know we've seen cases that international pressure has backfired. Um, okay, let me move on, Borzos, because you're in a particularly difficult situation as, as BBC Persian. What, what can you do, what can't you do? Uh, I think uh, we, we won't deal with this situation as one by one situations. We have a policy and we will follow the policy and I think this is the best to not to mix the news with the politics and things, things like mm. that. There is something, something has happened outside and if it's a news you should cover that. It will make the government ang angry, it will make the government happy, it will I don't know, change the situation, it doesn't matter. I mean, you should report what is happening outside. And if these filmmakers are arrested, and as far as they are in jail, we will cover their story. I mean, we don't want to put pressure on Iranian governments by doing this coverage, or we want to, I mean, start negotiating behind the scene by not covering the, the, the story. Uh, we are working in a, quite clear and transparent uh, framework which is more based on journalism rather than being a campaigner which is just to reflect the reality mm -hmm. of the society and if something has it, it has the merit of the news it should cover it as far as uh, it, it's a news. Um, Mazia, what do you think from what Sarah's question mm -hmm. what should journalists do and not do and also what do you as a not just a journalist, but also a friend of these people and a, and a fellow filmmaker who suffered in Iran, what do you think can be done to try and help them? Well, I agree with say that it has to be on a case-to-case -case basis. I mean, I understand with Bozogmer's point, but I think that's too ideal because, I mean, and we don't live in an ideal world. So I think there's always a context on mm. a day-to-day basis. So we have to consider that. And if a family member is willing to talk, I think uh, journalists should talk to him or her. And also, uh, Said said that sometimes the publicity backfired. I have no clue which case the publicity backfired. Uh, all I know is that no one has been freed because people have been silent about that person. But people have mm. been freed because people have talked about them. And your own and case. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm the example of that. And I think uh, Sarah and you are actually a bit proud of you can talk about my campaign as well, because I think you had that dilemma as well. And going back to... Uh, we, all our concern was to make sure you were back here before the baby was born. That was all we cared about. Yeah. <laughs> and going back to uh, Coco's point about North Korea, I think that that's the ideal for some uh, people within the Iranian uh, government, that as the North Koreans, they believe that, you know, Kim Jong-il was born on a mountain and he, mm, was, he was touched by... Yeah, no one, they right, have the nice. same kind of theories about Khamenei as well that, you know, that when he was born he mentioned the name of the first Imam and that he is uh, basically uh, Allah's representative on earth and people want to make it into an Islamic but I also mentioned that this is not going to happen in Iran and Iran is not going to be North Korea because of the variety of nations, cultures, languages, because of the history that this gentleman who fled uh, After I wrote down the book I recommended. <laughs> Lindsay, you know, uh, uh, right. left. I think it's not going to happen and it will eventually lead to the demise of this system. But I think if you ask some people within the Iranian government, especially conservative establishment, they would say that North Korean, Islamic North Korea would be the ideal system for Iran. Drew, Amnesty is a campaigning organization. Um, many people here, I'm sure, have written letters for prisoners of conscience to various governments. Is that, in this case, is that the kind of thing you're recommending? What, what kind of pressure... For these can, five. For these five. For what these kind five. of pressure 
do you think can be brought to bear? What can people in this audience or outside do to try and help these five people and other people who are suffering from these kind of human rights abuses in Iran? But I think we, we are, you know, we're not a news organization. For us, it is a case-by-case -case basis. There are cases where families say, no, don't raise what happened to so-and-so. And there are cases, indeed, where publicity has backfired, where we have uh, made a statement about so-and-so, and that person has been even further, uh, even worse treated afterwards. So I think it is a case-by-case -case basis. And the analysis that we try to take is what leverage do they have? What, uh, what access do they have to other levers and other people in, the, in, in their own field, in their own structure, in their own friends and, and, and coll colleagues and contacts that, that can help them as well? Um, these ones are, this case, are far more straightforward. I think we would uh, call for their name to be continually brought up, raised, constantly raised, such as the way of students. I think if, if, uh, if our friends at SOAS have a film evening, like on the 24th of October, then perhaps we should all go along and see some of their films. Um, and yeah, I think we put them in the public domain. Twitter is a little bit rubbish when it comes to Iran. I think there's uh, Ali Larajani, the Supreme Leader, um, there's a couple of Ahmadi Najjar accounts. Uh, they, don't, uh, they don't tweet very often. I don't know who's looking at them. There's a f much, much funnier one. There's a guy who's pretending to be Ahmadi Najjar. Um, a fake Ahmadi Najjar, I love it. Um, <laughs> can I just clarify on the one yes. basis, one by one? I didn't mean reporting it. You know, you never compromise on reporting. Right, but on campaigning. Uh, w case by case, in, in terms of whether to contact the people inside Iran, and I think that's what the BBC does itself. You know, they think whether we should contact people or not for for, for the stories. In terms of reporting something, no, there is no compromise in reporting um, anything. And also, there is a petition right now yeah. that you can We're all sign. And to people bring this up. who are yeah who are watching the podcast or uh, whatever, they can go to uh, that petition page and. Please re enter your on password. It's on my Facebook wall, so if you become my friends on Facebook, you can't see that. Everybody's your friend on Facebook, Mazia. Yeah, that's the problem. Wait, uh, Roxana's just going to try and put this up so people can see that this is a petition on Facebook. On iPetition, yes. Yeah, so on iPetition, right. Thingy, which is, yeah. now, we, I think we, exactly. I have no idea whether these things have any impact, mm -hmm. but um, Free the Iranian Filmmakers is up there and. I think that all of us here tonight um, hope that they will be <coughs> free very soon and that, as Saeed has pointed out, that the many other Iranians who are imprisoned for saying what they think, for doing any kind of things which would be completely normal for us here tonight, who they're also imprisoned, that they may also soon be free. Thank you very much for joining Thank us. You.